Okay, this is going to be a struggle for me. Yes. <laughs> so, so my name is Robin. Um, I'm a Dutch, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm also a member of the ADB Dutch Chamber. Um, I started my startup journey uh, when I was 11. I read a book uh, called uh, Remy Alone in the World. Uh, it's about a little kid who's homeless in Paris and joins a troop of uh, street musicians. Um, and just after I read that book, uh, there was something in the Netherlands called Queen's Day. And Queen's Day, as more Dutch people here know, is basically a huge flea market all around the country. People sell all their old stuff in the street. But a lot of people also are street musicians and make money that way. So I tried that and I made 12 guilders in one hour, hour, which is a lot of money if you're 11 years old. So I figured this is a pretty, pretty decent job, to, job, and I kept on doing that. So, what did you play? Sorry? What did you play? Shoot, shoot. Oh. Uh, so after about a year, I saved up around 2,000 guilders. Um, and then I told my parents, uh, I'm going to buy a very big stereo. I have a brother who's nine years older than me, and he just bought a really big stereo, so I figured I need one too. Uh, my parents said no. So my father said, okay, you can have this small transistor radio, and then the rest we're going to do something wise with. And I bought stocks in a company at the time called CMG, which was a big software house from the UK. Uh, that company IPO'd five years later on the Dutch exchange. Um, basically, I made a very good return, and that enabled me to start investing in stock exchange in the Netherlands. Uh, since then, I've always been investing, so I've been through the dot-com bubble, I've been through the financial crisis, uh, I've made money and I've lost, lost a lot of money too. When I was 21, I did my first angel investment. Um, it was a company called Behold, they were doing role-based access, um, meaning that very big companies who hire a lot of people all the time uh, have a system which enables them quickly to onboard people and give them access to all the systems. So that since then I've done three more investments, but it's always been a always been a side hobby. I never imagined actually starting a company and doing this more professionally. Uh, other than that, I have a master in public policy and public administration, so totally irrelevant for what I do nowadays. Um, I worked for Accenture ING Bank before I moved here, and now I'm the founder CEO of the startup. Bank. So the which will pop up in five seconds. Yep. Damn, this is <laughs> annoying. <laughs> okay, I'll just continue. At some point, a different sheet will come up. Um, the, so the startup buddy is actually my second startup. Um, when I came here in 2015, uh, in December, I started I pitched my company. I don't know, turn your laptop around. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Just so you know, there's a big difference between what we're trying to do. So, um, in 2015, I participated in Startup Week in Singapore, which is a yearly hackathon here in Singapore. And I pitched an ID for an online financial planning platform. Uh, long story short, I worked with two other guys on that for about a year and a half, and it failed. Um, this was a very painful experience, but what we actually got out of that was uh, we started thinking, how is it possible that three guys like us with a pretty decent brain, with a pretty decent experience in corporate life and things like that, are not able to pull off a startup like this? So we started thinking, if we cannot do this in one go, a lot more people probably have the same problem. So that's why we started the Startup Buddy. Uh, the Startup Buddy basically has a, has as an ambition to enable anybody who wants to. Yeah, there it's fine. <laughs> okay, so usually we'll be speaking about something that will pop up in a minute. Press now. Or speak slower. And. Um, so we have developed an online platform that allows anybody to become an entrepreneur, find all the resources and everything that you need in terms of mentoring, network, learning, toolkits in one place. Um, more about that later. 
Now back to why we're here. So we're going to talk this evening about fundraising and venture capital. But to actually explain fundraising and venture capital, you first need to understand a little bit of what startups are. So calling yourself a startup nowadays is very popular. Even Facebook still calls itself a startup. Uh, but a startup is not a small version of a regular company. Uh, this is, I think, the best definition of a startup. So, a startup is a temporary organization in search of a scalable and repeatable, profitable business model. That's very different definition from an actual company. Um, how does that work in practice? So, most startups, when they start out, they start with an ID. But they don't have customers, they don't have traction, they don't have revenue, and, and none of that. Um, and it usually takes quite a long time to actually find all those things. A very famous example of that is Airbnb. Uh, some of you have, might, might have heard this story before. So Airbnb started in 2007. Uh, the two initial founders were living in San Francisco, and there was a big conference there. And all the hotels there were booked out. So they figured, if all the hotels are booked out, we can make maybe some money by just putting some air mattresses in our uh, room and ask money for that. So they made a website, they put the mattresses, uh, mattresses in their apartment, and they charge uh, 80 US dollar per person. And three people actually did that. So they figured, hey, there's actually people doing this, we could do something with it. From there onwards, they tried all kinds of stuff, and it took them uh, two years until their first round of funding, which they got by going into Y Combinator, which is now one of the most famous accelerators in the world. But the time in between, they had virtually no users whatsoever. So on average, they made the first year less than $200 a month. And you can imagine if you already have a headcount of free by then, you cannot run your company based on that $200. This is very normal for startups. Because startups, what they initially need to do is have faster slides and uh, have a minimum viable product. Uh, which will come up any second. <laughs> uh, so what startups try to do when they build their business is first come up with something that sort of represents what they want to do. Um, why do startups do that? Because they don't have the resources and the money and the time and the knowledge to actually come up with everything that you want. Um, imagine, for example, uh, Henry Ford, a little bit over 100 years ago. He probably came up with, I wasn't there, but he probably came up with the idea, I want to bring people from A to B. And I want to do that with something that might be called a car. Now, he probably first came up with one of the tires and, and a steering wheel that still couldn't transport people from A to B. Um, so then, gradually, he had to invest more and more and more in actually building something that had a one horsepower engine, that had a steering wheel, four, four, four tires, etc., and that couldn't transport you from A to B. But it started with something much smaller. Uh, startups work the same way, and they try to every time learn what works and make it gradually better. Then, after they have come up with MVP and it seems to work a little bit, they have to find customers. If you come up with something that nobody has used before, it's very hard to find customers. When Airbnb started out, their story was, you know what you're going to do? You're going to sleep in a random stranger's house and pay for it. Nowadays, that makes a lot of sense because we all know what Airbnb does, but 10 years ago, everybody thought you were insane. And now they are really fairly successful. So um, after you've come up with your MVP, you have your vision, etc., you have to find, OK, I have this product. It sort of works. Now can I find the customers that are really willing to, to pay for this and, and work on this? All that period, typically, you don't make money. Um, because you're still very much in search of, of what you're doing and, and what will work. So startups are typically burning money. It's called burn rate. Uh, basically, the burn rate is the money you're spending more than that you're receiving. Um, there's a misconception that burn rate is the same as spending a lot of money on marketing so you can grow your business. Uh, for example, Redmark. That's not really the idea behind behind burn rate. Burn rate is the intention of now investing money to 
later on have something that will grow so quickly that you can make up for the, the money you were spending extra for the in-between period. Um, so this explains why startups need to raise funding all the time. They don't have revenue. Uh, it will take some time to actually get to the point of revenue that can actually cover the expenses that they have. So they have to reach out to other sources of, of funding. The sources of funding uh, are here on the screen. <laughs> Um, so, uh, ideally, your source of funding is always revenue. Um, and investors, by far, are most in, most tempted to invest in your company if that's something that you have at a very early stage. But it's very difficult to do. If you're very early stage, usually you might have some some revenue to to be able to prove your your MVP and to see if there's product market fit. But it will not be enough to actually cover the cost of your business. Uh, the second most popular source of funding is bootstrapping. Uh, I saw somewhere that it's the same as revenue. I highly doubt that. In general, bootstrapping is considered to be using whatever financial means a founder can find uh, that is within his own reach. So savings, not paying your keep yourself a salary. Um, Airbnb is very famous for having used 25 credit cards and building up a lot of uh, debt because of that. They also s sold $30,000 in uh, cereals, which were called Ab Obama Bows. They sold them for $40 a box and made a profit of, I think, 39 each. And that was their starting capital for the, for the second year they were in business. So all of that's called bootstrapping. Uh, basically using your own means and your own, own money to actually get up the ground. Then we have private equity. Private equity usually doesn't really apply to startups. Uh, private equity are investors that typically go into more traditional businesses that expect dividend payouts or that try to merge companies and that way uh, achieve um, uh, efficiencies. Um, grants, I on purpose put very small. Uh, grants are extremely popular here in Singapore because it's fairly easy it's actually very easy to get a grant, especially if you're Singaporean. Um, but this is a very Singaporean phenomenon, uh, meaning that most other countries in the world, you, you do get a lot of tax breaks if you're running a business. But just getting money right in the bank to start your own business from the government it doesn't happen much in other countries. Um, when you've run out of all of these options, you get to venture capital. So venture capital is a financing that investors provide to startup companies and small businesses that are believed to have long-term growth potential. The key words here are believed and potential. What I'm trying to say with that is if a venture capital investor invests in your company, there's usually very little to go by. They can a lot of them actually try to make a spreadsheet, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. So, typically, venture capital will go into an initial ID that looks looks good, that they believe in. Typically, a lot of investors look very much for what type of founder uh, is running the company as well. But it's still very much like believing this can get somewhere in three, four, five, six, seven years from now, not today. Um, and the reason they put in the money now is purely because of the potential. If they're right, then it can be incredibly big and they're done with their fund for life. But the fact of the matter is, uh, a general saying is that nine out of 10 startups fail. So a lot of the times they will be wrong too and they have to make up for that loss. Now you might have heard of the different stages of fundraising, uh, series A, B, C, etc. Uh, that has a little bit to do with the growth cycle of a startup. Uh, obviously, when you start your startup, it's by far the most risky for an investor to actually give you money to make it work. Um, so typically, the earliest stage for fundraising is, is called seed investing. It takes longer and longer, right? Um, uh, it's called seed investing. The reason you have to break up your fundraising in different stages is because it will be virtually impossible to find an investor who will, yeah, sorry, there is. So it will be virtually impossible to find an investor 
who will just give you $10 million and will tell you come back in eight years and by then uh, uh, I'm sure it will be great. That typically doesn't really happen. So you have to kind of break up the money that you will need in those eight, ten years to actually get to a very successful company in pieces. And every stage of your fundraising, the proof of what you have in mind will work better has to be, m has to be more credible. So at the earliest stage, it's very not credible. Usually you, you have a pitch deck with this is my vision, I'm going to build a five billion dollar company, uh, give me 400,000 and believe that I will do it. Sort of. So when you get to the series A, it should be a little bit further. So you should have your, your MVP, you should have a little bit of product market fit, so you should be able to demonstrate that customers are actually willing to pay money for what you're doing. And over time, the amount of proof that you're supposed to give gets, gets bigger and bigger. The good thing is, the amount of investment that you're receiving should be bigger and bigger too. Um, so by Series B, you really should be in the, in the spread, spreadsheet stage and being able to show exactly like this month we're going to grow this much more if we have this much more money to invest. Now these stages, they correspond with different kind of investors. That will show up in two minutes on this screen. Um, so usually the first external investors that you will go to are people you know. Um, they will probably invest in you, pro not because they actually believe that you're going to build a successful company, but just because they like you. And they're typically called friends and family. Um, then banks and governments, I keep a little bit outside of this presentation, but in Singapore really do apply for a grant if you are eligible. Um, and then of course you have angel investors, of whom we'll have a few on the panel uh, later on. So, as I shared at the start, I've been an angel myself since I was 21. Uh, I'm twice that old by now. So, um, angel investors come in all sizes and all tastes. Basically, they're people with money. And the reason they invest in companies can be very different, but typically, angels will invest in something they know something about and that they're interested in. Um, because of that, I also put this group of investors at the top of the sheet and the other ones below. The ones here at the top, they have hundreds of personal reasons for investment. But contrary to what a lot of founders think, a lot of angels don't that much invest purely because of the financial benefit. Of course, that's what they're trying to and what they're aiming for, but it's very often not the reason they get into it initially. Because usually it's something they do on the side. They have a regular job, or they built a successful business before, which they sold off, or, or whatever, and they want to try something else. So they know a lot about restaurants, so they like to stay in the restaurant space, but new kinds of approaches to that, for example. Um, for all investors, by the way, it's always very important to figure out what's the driver of this investor. Why, why do they do what they do? Uh, but for angels, it's really on a personal level why they do. Um, then, of course, there's angel groups. Uh, it's basically a lot of private people investing together. So Angel Central and Density are represented here later on today. They are groups of, of angels. The benefit of those angel groups is that they're also able to pool money together. Um, because some angels might only invest ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars in your business, which is not that much if you have to pay people. Um, so to actually get enough money all together. Uh, groups like Angel Central and Benzi are really helpful because they might be able to come up with two, three, four, five hundred thousand and get your round funded. <coughs> then accelerators and incubators. They are usually not stipulated as investors as such. I consider them investors because they will typically take your equity. Um, so what an accelerator usually does is uh, they provide a program anywhere between three and six months. And in order to get into that program, you have to apply. Uh, so you go through a lengthy questionnaire uh, describing what your company is about. And uh, based on that, they will, out of, let's say, 300 companies, select five or six. Those five or six companies go into the program. They get a cohort space like this. They get mentoring and all kinds of guidance. And in return, you give usually equity to the accelerator 
for being part of that program. Then family offices. Family offices, I don't want to explain too long. They're basically huge angels. So uh, people that are people or families that are wealthy enough to set up their own formal organization, do different large investments. Uh, very often family offices are also limited partners, meaning that they invest in VC companies and not directly into startups. Um, then venture capital firms, <coughs> which most of you that are in the startup scene have surely heard about. Venture capital companies are very different in their approach, approach to angel investors. Like I said, angel investors have their own money to invest in. And that means they can do whatever they like. VCs cannot. VCs are basically funds. So usually how a VC fund gets set up, uh, two or three people, the founding partners, decide to form a venture capital fund. What they basically do is set up a management services company for other investors. So for example, I'm setting up a fintech, a financial technology VC company. And I will go to pension funds, retirement funds, family offices, other, other sources of funding, and I will tell them, I'm going to invest with this fund in 10 different companies in the VC, uh, sorry, in the fintech sector. I'm going to invest $1 million in all of those companies, and you will get your money back in 10 years from now tenfold. Sort of, that will be their pitch. <coughs> Why is this important to understand? Because VCs don't actually own the money they invest in. And because of that, they are bound by the mandate that they have together with the limited partners. The mandate basically describes the rules that, that the VC partners are bound by for all their investment, their investments that they do. This is really very different from angels. So, so if you are trying to raise funds, keep that in mind. An angel just needs to like you. A VC needs to like you, and you have to fit in his mandate. Then finally, corporate uh, VCs. They're very similar to regular VCs, with the big difference is that they're usually connected to a big company like Unilever or Google, which usually means that the companies and the type of industry they will invest in is related to what the modern company does. Other than that, it's very similar. It can be fantastic if you get in, uh, get these type of investors, because if you, for example, would get <coughs> leverage on the Unilever network, you're probably set. Now, this I will keep very short because uh, next speakers are going to tell you more about uh, fundraising. Um, some founders think that fundraising is like a very new skill. Uh, fundraising is actually very similar to dating or sales. Um, if you are dating, you have to prepare first. Make sure you look good, that you get your story straight, that you don't stink, and stuff like that. Then you have to make the approach. Go to the lady or the guy, whoever your target is, um, and make that first make that first introduction to him or her. Then come up with your pitch. Whatever makes you interested, why he or she should go out with you. And then finally do the paperwork. Get married, uh, go to the uh, to the city hall, and get the deal done. Um, fundraising in most steps is very much the same thing. You connect you connect first to your investor. You get them to, to like you. You explain them what you do, which is your story. You make sure that you already built a credible business for the stage you're in, and get the paperwork done. Uh, how it's more in practice, Damien will tell you. <laughs> then, finally, a few things. Um, so with the Startup Buddy, we, we help companies raise funds from investors. And I'm not going to go into that now. You can ask me later on. But a few tips uh, to, to keep in mind that, that we have seen that a lot of uh, founders forget about. I already said, make first sure that, that you get a connection with an investor. There's, there's two reasons for it. First of all, it's mandatory and it's necessary. Secondly, if you get an investor in your company, you're going to get that investor for at least two years and probably a lot longer. If you don't have a personal connection, those are going to be two horrible years. So. A lot, of, a lot of founders think they have to go after whatever investor they can get, but do you really want to be working with somebody 80 hours a week for two years that you don't like? Um, then take feedback. What a lot of founders forget is when you start your company, you're obsessed by it and you work on it all the time. That's your full-time business. 
but the person that you're meeting, it's actually very much the same for your sales pitch. They, they just heard about you, they might have read your deck, and that's all they know. And they're going to ask a lot of questions that are really obvious to you. Don't take that as criticism and don't start arguing about it. Take it as feedback, see if you can use it, if you can use it, disregard it, but don't start arguing about it. Then, don't assume anything. Uh, I've talked to quite a lot of founders that think, well, this guy is really into fintech and I'm into fintech, so I don't need to explain him everything. That's really not true. Um, always really ask a lot of questions to the, to the investor that you're talking to, if he really understands what you're doing, where he comes from, what type of companies he's worked on before, and, and make sure that he really understands what you're working on. Don't assume because this guy, usually it's guys, uh, has been in this industry for 10 years, they will understand what you do. Then, valuation, please put it last. Uh, a lot of founders, when I meet them the first time, they will tell me, uh, okay, we do this and this and this, we need this and this and this much money. Oh, and by the way, we're worth 10 million. Uh, <laughs> the obvious question is why? <laughs> But secondly, it's not very useful. Like I already said, you have to make a connection with, with the person first. The only reason you have to come up with a valuation is because you're bargaining for a t-shirt and bouquet and you want to get the price from three to two dollars. But if you want a long-term relation for the investment of your company, this is something that you do after you got interested. Then, don't race for marketing. Uh, I've already seen a lot of pitch decks which will have some kind of pie chart and that will say we'll spend 60% on marketing. If you're spending 60% on marketing, it effectively means that your business model is not working by itself. Meaning that you can only sell your product if you buy enough AdWords or enough Facebook ads. Which basically means that fundamentally your business is broken. Marketing only becomes relevant after you've proven that your own story can actually work and that you need marketing to actually scale that quicker. <clears throat> and finally, understand your own investor. I've said that already a couple of times. Uh, somebody has been waving at me 10 times already, so I need to wrap it up. Um, so coming back to the startup idea, I already said uh, our goal is to actually to, to help all founders and all innovators anywhere, any place, any time to become successful, which is why we built our platform online. So we have users from 32 countries now that, because we're on the internet, <coughs> are able to build their businesses, and we don't take equity, we don't have a sign-up uh, fee. So basically, somebody on an island in the Philippines can try to build their own business as well. Um, this one all of a sudden pops up really quickly. So we provide mentoring, we uh, let you use toolkits that are very much used, for example, by startups in Silicon Valley, but also here in Singapore, like the value proposition canvas that lets you figure out who are my customers, what's my product. Um, you can work together with your team, just uh, basically go to the website, if you have an idea for a business, sign up and start working on your business. So if you want to know more about that, <coughs> I'll be here for the drinks. Uh, just let me know and I'll do my fundraising pitch for you. Thank you very much. Um, we're now going to Damien. Uh, Damien is the founder, which is an HR platform that allows big companies to actually retain their uh, their staff so they don't have a lot of fruit, but fruit, 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 fruit flow uh, of staff all the time. He's way better at explaining that than me. Besides that, he's had a very interesting uh, journey in his fundraising. So. Thank you.